Um, so in a complete change of pace, I, I <laughs> will be talking about something uh, very different, but um, I want to talk about, can we make building with open source AI as uh, simple as prompting ChatGPT? Um, just a quick introduction, because I know not everybody knows me. I'm an associate professor at CMU. Um, I research natural language interaction with computers through uh, agents, code generation, question answering, uh, multilingual natural language processing, uh, and machine learning for NLP, including modeling and interpretability. Um, I care a lot about open source and open research. I have, uh, from the beginning uh, of my PhD, every paper I've written is available online, I think. Um, you can check that, and if you find one that's not, I'll, I'll make it available. Um, most data and code is available open source. I've done some bigger open source projects like Dynet, and I'm currently involved in one called Open Devon right now, where we're trying to make a code assistant. Um, and then also just open source for my research. Um, in lectures and teaching materials, I try to make all of them available online. And I like to collaborate. So if you want to collaborate on something, please uh, reach out. Um, so thinking a little bit about what makes building with open source AI hard, uh, there's three things that I listed here. There's probably other things too. Um, but what I'm talking about here is I'm talking about mainly people who want to build with open source AI as opposed to the people who are building like foundation models for open source AI. And so some problems that they encounter are uh, open base models are often not competitive with GPT-4. Um, I think we all uh, experience this. And one solution to this is uh, building better open base models. And I greatly, greatly appreciate the work of all the people who are working on this. Um, also building better uh, open source uh, data sets for instruction tuning in RLHF. And everybody uh, is, many, many people are working on this, that's great. And also fine tuning models to specific use cases. Um, and all of these can help. Um, another problem that people encounter is large model deployment. So if you have a 70B model, um, which is you know, what you need to be uh, competitive in some cases, especially if you want a multi-purpose model, uh, that can be hard. Um, there's ways to solve this, and people are building like efficient deployment packages, uh, both for you know, deploying on GPUs quickly and also deploying on your local uh, machines. Um, also, uh, using smaller models or distilling models to reduce model size. Um, and another uh, thing that maybe is a little bit not paid attention to as much is that there's lots of design decisions to be made. And this is different than API providers, where basically they don't give you any design decisions because they don't want to tell you anything about how the system is made. Um, and so there's ways to fix this too, better educational materials, like lots of people are working on this, um, including uh, Hugging Face and uh, many other people, um, or some variety of automatic guidance, which I think people have not looked into as much. Um, I don't have a solution to all of these problems, uh, but I'm going to talk about one solution that I've been working on today that uh, focuses specifically on these uh, three uh, solutions, fine tuning models to specific use cases, uh, distilling models to reduce size and some variety of automatic guidance. Um, and uh, this is not finished. Uh, I, there's lots more to do, but um, I, I'm going to talk about one solution. So um, if we look at the traditional ML system development lifecycle, this is what our lives all looked like if we were in ML until like three years ago, right? And what it looked like is we had some description of the task we wanted to solve. Based on that, we created training data. Uh, maybe we got a base model. Maybe we had a randomly initialized model, depending on the uh, where we were at. We took the training data, put it into the base model, uh, created a system, and then we tested it and got some evaluation results. And maybe from those, we got ideas to improve our base system. Um, now, for a lot of people, it looks like this, right? You write a task description, you put it into ChatGPT, and suddenly it works. Um, and it may kind of work. It may not be like completely satisfying. You may not be satisfied with paying lots of money to open AI for GPT-4, but you know, uh, what, what are you gonna do? So uh, I'd like to talk about some work uh, that we did recently. Um, this was mainly led by two students, uh, Vijay Viswanathan, uh, who's a PhD student at CMU, and Chen, Chen Yang uh, Zhao, who was an intern um, at CMU, who is actually going to be at NYU, I think, uh, starting this fall. So the picture is here. <laughs> 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 yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it's in New York, actually. So I, I didn't. Uh, my image recognition abilities were not as good. As well. um, yeah. So uh, so uh, much of the credit goes to them. But anyway, basically, what I want to talk about is: um, Are we able to take 
this rather complicated figure and turn it into something where we automate away all of the steps except writing a task description. And that will allow us to um, you know, essentially make it uh, reasonably easy to get a competitive model uh, with no more you know, conceptual work than uh, you know, prompting chatty. So uh, what I'm gonna talk about is training data set retrieval and generation, um, model retrieval, and uh, data formatting and training and um, evaluation data set generation. So um, I'll, I'll talk about each of these in turn. So our input uh, to the system is um, a prompt uh, describing the task and few shot examples. In all of our experiments, we use three examples uh, here. So it's all three shot uh, prompting basically. Uh, with the idea being that coming up with a task description and three data examples is not that hard for any task that you care about, you know, sufficiently. Um, and the output is a trained model. And everything that happens in between, um, the user could, you know, know, like, try to intervene on that, but they don't need to. So it, it would be all automatic. So um, in each of the steps, uh, we do some simple things to make them work. Um, and so the first thing that we do is we search uh, for data set retrieval. We try to retrieve relevant data sets from basically the Hugging Face uh, data set repository. The way we do this is um, Hugging Face has an idea of data set cards and model cards. And sometimes these are good. Um, often they're not, but uh, often uh, they're good, especially for data sets, often they're good. Um, often for models, they're not as good. But um, basically what we do is uh, we have the data, the data set card um, and then we train a retriever uh, where basically we take in our prompt and we try to match our, uh, the test description to the most relevant data set. And we actually have a previous paper where we did this, it's called Data Finder. And the way we did this is we uh, took a neural bioencoder model based on cyber and we trained it on positive examples that were harvested with pairs of paper abstracts, which is kind of a concise description of what they did in the paper and um, the data sets that were used in the paper. So we could look up what data set was used in the paper. We actually used some data from uh, AI2. So thank you, AI2 folks. Um, and uh, that gave us positive examples. And then we got hard negatives using BM25. And these are examples of data set cards that like don't match. Uh, or that were not used in the paper. Um, some tasks don't have related existing data sets. So we have tasks where nobody has created a training data set for this task before. So um, in our original version of the prompt to model paper, um, what we did is we essentially retrieved data sets and we generated data sets. So we just generated data sets from a teacher model. Here for the teacher model, we use GPT 3.5 turbo because we also don't want to pay GPT-4 API fees. Um, so we use GPT 3.5. Um, we encountered a challenge here, um, which is uh, creating diverse yet high quality examples based on three shot examples is hard. Um, so we had kind of a heuristic method, uh, which basically what we did is we first used a few shot user provided examples with a low temperature. And this allowed us to generate higher quality examples that are in the close proximity to the user generated examples. Then we gradually branched out, adding uh, previously generated examples and increased the temperature to get more diversity. And um, also we use self consistency to improve accuracy of the outputs. So we would sample multiple outputs and, and take the ones that had high, uh, were voted highly self consistent. Um, so that's how we created data. Um, for model retriever, we searched against the Hugging Face models uh, using their model card. This is actually hard. This is definitely an unsolved problem. Um, and the reason why is because actually many of the model cards are not very indicative of what tasks the models will be good at. Um, so what we ended up doing is uh, we took our query, we generated, um, we used a method called hide where you basically generate a hypothetical um, document uh, that uh, is kind of like a model card. And then we uh, looked it up using BM25 to retrieve a relevant model. Um, this didn't work super well out of the box. So additionally, we scaled uh, this with the log times the number of model downloads. 
which gave us uh, popular models and popular models tend to be good. Um, and so uh, that managed to improve our results. Um, there's a lot of other things that I would do, like looking into the Hugging Face leaderboard uh, scores or something else like that now, but uh, th that's what we did. Um, for fine tuning, uh, what we did is we converted all data sets into a text to text format. So we only handled um, problems that could be done in a text to text format. And we only considered text to text models. Um, so, like encoder decoder models and auto aggressive language models to support this format. Um, and then we shuffled together uh, the data sets and fine tuned with the default hyperparameters uh, for this uh, for these models. And finally, because we also want to have an idea of how well our models are doing, we also automated evaluation. And the way we automated evaluation, again, there's lots of things that could be improved about this. But basically, we took a held out set from the generated and retrieved data sets and use that as an evaluation set. So we have some experiments. Um, basically, what we did is we had three tasks. We picked these tasks intentionally uh, because we wanted tasks that represented a variety of situations where people might actually use models. So for the first one, um, we did squad, uh, which is machine reading question answering. Here, there's lots of data and models available. And so we would expect that even if you were just able to retrieve the best model from Hugging Face, you'd actually do reasonably well on this. Um, is this cheating? I think it's actually not cheating because a lot of people want to do very traditional tasks and they just need guidance towards the right model or right data set to train on. these. So I think that's okay. That's one use case. Another one we had was Japanese to Python code generation. Um, there's relevant data available in Hugging Face, but there's no training set for Japanese to Python code generation in, data, in Hugging Face, or at least when we did this. And so because of this, this is a harder situation. Also, there's not very good models for Japanese to Python. There are good Japanese models, there's good Python models, but not good Japanese to Python models. And then finally, we have temporal expression normalization. So this is a task where nobody has created a training data set, but there are test data sets. And this is kind of representative of like the weird things that people want to do with prompting, like please format um, this CSV table into a LaTeX table. That's like 80% 80, 80 of my chat GPT usage, but you know, a lot of people do uh, that, sort of, uh, that sort of thing. So results, um, these are the results that we have. Uh, we have prompt model our full system up here. Um, and then we have ablations without model retrieval and without data retrieval, data set retrieval, where we just took, you know, like um, the, mo the most popular model um, and most popular data or, or um, and just generated data. And um, we compare with GPT 3.5 Turbo, which was our, our teacher model. And we can see that actually um, compared to GPT 3.5 Turbo, with our best system, we're able to exceed uh, its results. And a lot of this, some of this lift is from our data set generation and stuff like this. Some of it is just because there are good models on Hugging Face that can solve these problems reasonably well if you give them a little bit of a boost. Um, for the middle one, um, we had a problem of lack of a strong Japanese encode base model and data set and also poor diversity in the generated data because GPT 3.5 wasn't very good at generating this data. So um, it works some of the time, it doesn't work, uh, doesn't work all the time. Um, I'd like to also talk a little bit about automating evaluation uh, because I think this is interesting. Um, I was actually at a talk uh, by, or on a panel in a tutorial by Andrew Ng at um, NeurIPS. And one of the things he, it was about building on large language models. And one of the pieces, pieces of advice that he gave people was don't evaluate your model. That was like literally his piece of advice for people who are trying to build applications on top of large data sets. His uh, reason for this was basically like, if you start out by thinking about how you're gonna evaluate your model, it's way easier to build a system around this model than it is to evaluate it. So, you know, don't, uh, you know, if you're worrying about evaluating your model, you can just, start out by deploying it, especially if it's in a low risk situation, and then gradually ramp up and start evaluating. So I, I don't know if I agree with that, but the fact of the matter is it's a lot easier to create something by prompting ChatGPT now than it is to evaluate it rigorously. So automatic evaluation is kind of, you know, of interest. 
So then the question is, um, does generating synthetic data um, and evaluating, or, or does retrieving and generating this data and evaluating on it correspond with the accuracy that you'd get if you uh, actually did the evaluation directly on the data set you're interested in? And the answer is um, tentatively maybe yes, but with a big caveat. So what you can see is on all three data sets that we tested, there's a reasonably strong correlation between the um, between the evaluated or the generated test set and the real test set. But the problem is if you look at the very best models, um, like for example here, there's actually an anti-correlation between the evaluation num numbers up here. So I think the answer is uh, automatic evaluation, at least with the method that we use for it, works for distinguishing really bad systems and really good systems, but it doesn't work for distinguishing really good systems from each other. So that's you know an area where we have. So um, this is obviously a lot cheaper than doing annotation with human uh, human annotations. And um, our accuracy was comparable. We got within a 0 0.1 accuracy by using this, um, uh, this data, um, or like the prompt to model system. And then um, another uh, thing that I'd like to point out is, of course, all of this is open source. Um, you can play around with it. And we tried to make it uh, modular so that you can pull out like one part of it. Like I only want to do data set retrieval or I only want to do data set generation. All of the pieces can be uh, used. Um, so there's some current and future directions. Um, there's directions that we're working on now. And this one I'm pretty excited about. We're going to have, this is already in the prompt model code base and we're going to have um, an archive paper shortly. And the basic idea here is can we do uh, data retrieval and then generation, or data retrieval and then modification, uh, with the idea being that even if there's not a perfect data set for what you want to be doing, there might be a data set that's close enough that if you modified it into the appropriate format, you would be able to do better. And we see pretty uniform improvements by doing this, where you retrieve a related data set and then you generate, um, uh, you modify it into the appropriate format. This can also possibly fix the, you know, like Japanese to Python problem because you could retrieve English to Python examples, but then translate them into Japanese. So that would um, uh, fix, uh, that would help there. Another thing that we're interested in is we use GPT 3.5 to generate data. Um, I'd like to not have to use GPT 3.5 at all. So um, we're looking into uh, whether models can be used to generate their own data and then uh, basically self-improve their results. We have some interesting results with this. Um, we found that this manages to fix formatting problems. So it's definitely really good at fixing like the formatting of the output and other things like that, um, which results in better, uh, better accuracy, but it's not you know, a silver bullet, obviously, because you're limited by the overall strength of your own model. Um, some other directions that I haven't had time to take a look at yet, but I think are really interesting here is end-to-end um, -end optimization uh, to improve the accuracy. So we have a bunch of moving parts in this system, but how can we uh, train all of them to improve the system overall? Um, also better learning under compute constraints. So I didn't mention this, but we uh, limited the size of our models and we limited the size of our generated data sets. Um, but what if we wanted to say like, okay, you have $5,000, make the best model you possibly can. What's the best way to allocate that? Do you want to generate more data? Do you want to use a larger model? Um, other stuff like that. So how, how can we figure that out? Um, and also all of this was text to text, but you know, multimodal stuff is extremely interesting nowadays. So how can we adapt this to, um, to multimodal data? So um, that, that's my presentation. Uh, like, I, I think, that's one idea about how we can remove barriers into adoption of open source, like the existing open source ecosystem by people who want to build on it, but don't maybe have the expertise of the people in this room. Um, but then my, my other question is like, what are the biggest barriers to adoption of existing open source AI models and uh, what technical solutions may address them? So uh, I'd also be happy to talk about, you know, that in general, uh, 